Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? My name is Eric. Today on Double Feature, we have the Splat Pack expert, Michael Kessler. <laughs> Michael, what is up? How are you doing? I'm doing all right today. We got two films on the yeah. show today. What are we doing? We're going to do Taken and P2. Why don't we start with Taken? Although that doesn't make any sense, but let's do it anyways. Um, we have, before we start with Taken, we have some spoilers coming up on the show. We're going to tell you uh, who the captors are, who the captives are, and how they get away. Mm -hmm. All of that will be spoiled inside the show. Also, I don't know if actually one of us is going to do a Liam Neeson impression at any point. I'll try, maybe. I don't really, it might happen. Despite the radio voice, I don't actually have a Liam Neeson impression we'll to, to give see. you. So that might be up to you. So um, I won't spoil you on whether or not this show will include that. We have chapters mm -hmm. to skip around. So if you were expecting us to do P2 first... Then you can skip right to that, and then you can come back, skip back to Taken, and then skip to the end of the show. Great. This show's all about choice, so uh, of course we're going to do that. Not only are we talking about captive situations today, but I think we're going to be pretty director-heavy. We're going to be talking about uh, the people who made these films, because they're kind of action films. And God damn it, I want to know who made them. So let's start with Taken. Uh, who's behind Taken? Taken is written by Luke Besson. But it's directed by Pierre Morel. All right. So why don't we start with Luke first? Because right. we've seen him on the show before. Yeah. He directed Fifth Element. Mm -hmm. um, he also directed Leon the Professional. That was one of his early, right, earlier right. films, which is kind of where Natalie Portman got her start. Right. And and recently he's been writing more mm -hmm. than directing. Which I am A-OK -okay with. Yeah. Most of the time it turns out pretty good. Although that might be sad because I, I do like him as a director mm -hmm. too. So um, well, He's been tied up doing those Arthur and the Invisibles, that like kid movie series. Is that what that is? Yeah. I don't know anything it's, about that. It's about this little kid. and I don't know. He's really. invisible? No. He meets these Invisibles. I think they're tiny people. Tiny people, got it. Uh, Pierre Morel, though, I didn't know Pierre Morel before uh, investigating Taken. Pierre's been, uh, you know, he was in uh, that movie that you saw. I haven't seen that. What was that? Oh, from Paris with Love. Yeah, yeah from he Paris with Love. That. Uh, sorry, did I say he was in yeah, that movie? He yes, he directed that movie. Um, but he's been a cinematographer for, you know, two decades or something. You could definitely see that yeah, in Taken. Yeah, for sure. It's a very sharp film, very gorgeous film. Uh, and then, of course, there is the cast. Liam Neeson, I think, is the thing to talk about sure. in this cast. He basically carries the entire well, movie. Yeah. And it's not an easy film to carry. No, no. You, you're you presented with... Okay, so a number of people saw the trailer, and I, I, we always talk about how we don't like to talk about the trailers to right, films. Right, right. Unless it's important. Because we just don't see the trailers. Right. I mean, nine times out of ten, that's the case. We avert our eyes during the trailers. But the trailer to Taken is important in that the plot of the film, there's an entire scene mm -hmm. in Taken that is essentially just is the trailer. Yeah, it's the titular scene, right? The they're going to take you scene. That whole scene is the trailer of the film. Mm -hmm. So anyone who's seen the trailer knows the plot going in, which is a difficult task as an actor because Liam Neeson's only strong role where he gets to interact with somebody to set the mood for the film mm -hmm. has already been, the cover's been blown. Yeah. The audience knows it going in. So he has to carry a film which is largely solo and fighting yeah. and make us feel like it's more than just ass kicking. Yeah, that's probably the most dialogue he gives. Uh, you know, I mean, the most dialogue he gives not as a father, but as an ass kicker. Right. You know, he doesn't talk, he does some interrogations and I think you really get to see that stuff there. But early on, it's just about him being a father, his interactions with his former co-workers, let's say, yeah. um, other people who are in the business with him, with his ex-wife, who is a total bitch. Absolutely. Why does she have to be such a dick all the time? I don't know. And it's weird because it's not like she's an above and beyond bitch. She's right. totally legitimate in all her bitchiness. Mm -hmm. At least she thinks so. She's a static character, much like all of these characters. Mm -hmm. It's a very straightforward you could almost call it high concept. Yeah. Right? I mean, even even down to the titular yeah, line. Absolutely. It's taken. His daughter is taken. He has to get her daughter back. That's all we're dealing with here. We're not going to get too heavy into characters changing dramatically over time. Really, the only change is, you know, Liam Neeson's character, Brian. He doesn't change at all. He is a badass the entire right. time. And if anything, he's more solidified at the end. His points are more validated because we see 
they lay that stuff heavy on you in the beginning. He's um, a domineering father. He may or may not have been there during uh, his daughter when his daughter was growing up. Right. It's funny because his friends give him shit about it. Sure. Like, well, you always left the job to go to your daughter's birthday party. Well, essentially, it seems like during his daughter's youth, he kind of shot himself in both feet because yeah. he never fully devoted himself to his work or, or his, his daughter. Family. So right. he ends up essentially because they're both full-time jobs, he ends up failing at both. <laughs> right. I mean, he's right. great when he's there. Yeah. He's, he's great. Just at not always he's, there. Yeah, sure. Sure. He's trying to take on two jobs at once. Uh, but his character is all about being a protective father. And at the end of the movie, you know, he starts the movie telling her, don't go over there. It's scary. It's dangerous. And he ends the movie basically in a position where he could just say, he doesn't say it, but it's kind of implied after what she mm-hmm. went through. See, I was right. right. The worst exactly. possible fucking thing happened yeah. to you. So she gets kidnapped. She gets sold into slavery. That's basically the... I think if there's any surprise to the story, it's that she's sold into this right. European sexual right. slavery. Well, there's actually two surprises. Because another surprise is what event- what originally lures her to the European evil land. Mm-hmm. Which is Paul Hewson in The Boys. Oh my god, Paul Hewson. I'm going to get to Paul Hewson in a second, who just keeps showing up on our fucking show. But I'm actually not ready for that yet, because I just cannot stop talking about Liam Neeson. All right, so we saw Liam Neeson on the show before, when we did Schindler's List. Yes. Um, Liam Neeson is fucking great all the time. Fallout 3, Liam Neeson Mm -hmm. is awesome. Uh, Schindler's List, Liam Neeson is awesome. Batman Begins, Liam Neeson is awesome. I thought, uh, and I might have mentioned this back when we did Schindler's List, but I used to think of Liam Neeson as a joke. I had never actually seen him in anything, but when people threw out the name Liam Neeson, I thought, oh yeah, probably a terrible, cheesy action mm-hmm. star or something. I had no idea that he could give such an incredible yeah. performance, basically because I was completely ignorant sure. about who Liam Neeson is. It happens. So that may be part of the reason I love him so much is because I've just totally blown away that here's somebody I totally dismissed, knew nothing about. And he turns out to just be fucking incredible yeah, all the time. He's one of the best. I mean, that's why action stars are at. Not that Liam Neeson is even an action no, star. Not at all. It's not one of the remotely. many things that. Yeah, one of the many, many different things that uh, that he can do. But I think you'll find that typical of a lot of action stars, they have to carry their film. Mm-hmm. They're not given a lot to work right. with. Well, he kind of parallels. So I mean, I've I've crash coursed myself in action stars. Yeah. More to a fault than to a game. <laughs> All right. Um, but there are two there are two camps of action stars. There's the camp where you're just along for the ride because they're so damn badass. I'm right. throwing up quotes here. Because yeah, those are I some some scare quotes. I think those are. I called. just I I don't like Jason Statham. Okay. I can't get into that. It's just I, I hear you on I, that. I do not identify with the people that identify with him. Our producer's ex husband had me watch that movie where he drives things around. Every what movie is that, is that movie. No, but you're but, thinking of the transporter. Oh, that was one of the worst. things. Things I have ever seen in my life. I can't get into that. Yeah. However, then there's the other side of the camp where it's it's kind of fifty percent badass and fifty mm-hmm. percent owning the badass. Yeah, way. yeah, right. That's Stallone. That's Dolph Lundgren. That's Kurt Russell when he's put in the right, right. role. And those I think are, Bruce Willis on his yeah, good days. Absolutely, I mean a, cu- a couple different guys. Sure. They really have to be given the right. Tools and that's to do where that. Liam Neeson falls in. Right. Taken, he falls as somebody who you're rooting for, not because they're doing all this stuff you can't believe they're doing, right? But because you're behind them, you like them, and you want to see them succeed. And it only makes it better that they can, that yeah. they're a capable person to have succeed well and even an audience like us wants to see them succeed so often in these movies we root for the villains even in p2 a little bit i think we're going to be rooting for the villain because that's kind of the nature of a movie like that you want it to um, you know modern day exploitation you want it to be fucked up you want it to have a downer here we're looking at a film with so much french talent behind it it just seems natural that we want people to be tortured and we want to go through these incredibly fucked up situations but Liam Neeson is just such a powerhouse that we're so behind him. We just want to see him kick all of the bad guys' asses and, you know, save his daughter. Which brings me to his daughter. I'm a fan of Maggie Grace. I know you are. I'm confused by Maggie Grace in this film. Okay, so here's what confuses me. She's either 8 or she's 45, and I'm not really sure. What... So I know her mostly from Lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was Shannon in Lost. Right. And she portrayed someone back then older than she is now in Taken. She started showing up a lot more in films after she was done. I think she was on Lost for two seasons Mm -hmm. or something. And after that, she started showing up in films 
often playing, you know, in the horror genre or in kind of light action stuff. Yeah. As she popped a, up in the remake of The Fog. Yeah, I mean, you know, really young role. I haven't yeah. seen The Fog, so I don't know if she was a really young role in that. She but wasn't here, super young, but it here was, she's supposed to be what seventeen? Seventeen. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the actress is probably in her mid twenties, pushing thirty. Yeah. Right. Right. Maggie Grace. But Kim is supposedly 17 years old. She's excited almost as much by her karaoke machine as she is her brand new pony. Her brand new fucking pony. And here she is getting sold into sexual slavery. I love how Brian gets her a karaoke machine and Stuart gets her a fucking pony. I mean, you want to talk about a great script. Just the way, maybe it's part of how that's acted out too. But having that written in and then seeing what they do with it, I mean, she is ecstatic. So Maggie Grace, in the beginning of this movie, every time Liam Neeson's character, every time Brian does something kind of nice, she gets crazy. She jumps up and down. She's very bubbly. Very, very, I mean, 12 or 13 mm-hmm. year olds. You know, I don't know any Jumping 17 on furniture. year olds. I don't remember anybody in my life who was ever 17 who acted like this. Maybe 12 or 13. But all right, pushing that aside. So she gets excited about this karaoke machine which apparently all of the major pop stars use, despite the fact it's at, what, a Radio Shack or something. Uh And uh, she gets excited about this, and you're thinking that's the pinnacle of her excitement, the peak. That's as excited as she's going to get. Turns around, Stuart bought her a pony, and she flips the fuck out. It's just such a, your heart just drops for Brian, you know? He he went in there and he investigated all this, what does he say, read the manual cover to cover uh, a million times or whatever. And he gives her the gift and it looks like everything's going okay. And then she turns around and there's a pony. Instantly forgets that Brian even exists. It's just so fucking sad. And Stuart's a douchebag, like the yeah. other static characters in this Stepfathers film. Stepfathers are always douchebags you're just, in film. You're meant to hate him, and you hate him pretty much through the whole movie. I mean, we even saw that with Thank You for Smoking. The yeah. stepfather's just a douchebag. But then you have the side of her where she's 40. Now, you disagree with me on this, and you know things about music, and I know survivalism so yeah, maybe i'm just right. gonna go with you on this but she listens to paul hewson and the boys yeah. i thought the only people who listened to paul hewson were in their 40s or at least pushing on the late well, 30s the thing there. is the reason that a lot of people in their 40s listen to paul hewson is because that's how long they've been around you know they've been around since the late 70s early 80s so those people are now 40 but they were once 17 when their hit single like uh nameless streets and what's the other one um blood on a sunday Hello, hello. All right. And the other thing that's weird about Maggie Grace's character, and this isn't, you know, I'm not, I don't want to knock her as an actor. I think she, it wouldn't be as fun if she wasn't going crazy all of the time. So I think that's fine. Uh, it's something from the story that's kind of confusing to me. And maybe we can talk about this. She's worth half a million dollars on mm-hmm. the black market, apparently. Okay. All right. So this, again, <laughs> this maybe this is just... The businessman in me coming out. But that sounds at first, and I think the first thing I said to you was, you know, oh, they're going for two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars. That's you know, that's not a lot of money for a human life. But then I thought, this is sexual slavery. Making the most they could possibly be making in these, you know, little shacks that they're put in. Right. The trailers Uh, and Yeah. I mean, this has to be very, very cheap stuff. It looks like probably blue collar guys, maybe coming off the streets. Coming was really the wrong word to use there. But you know what I mean. Coming from the street to their mouths. Sorry. So fucking vulgar. But you know what I mean. They just, I was going to say they dip in here, but there's really no getting around <laughs> this. They enter the se- the house of sexual slavery. They achieve an orgasm onto one of these young or prostitutes. Into. Wow, you just can't. I thought I would just go as, as lowbrow as I could and I would escape anything you could. No, I guess not. All right. You get what I'm saying here, though. They make... I would say relative, they're not high-end escorts. I don't even think they're making money. Yeah, well, probably not. But these guys are, that's my point, is these guys are paying money to do this to the people who mm-hmm. own them. You could not make half a million dollars if you sold one of the, well, how long does that work, selling those girls? Five years? Maybe. I mean, when they're 30, I mean, that, well, that but doesn't work anymore, At the rate anymore, they're right? using them, I mean, those those girls are broken in three years. Okay, so that's my point. How are you going to get half a million dollars out of Maggie Grace's character? Well, I see, that's the thing, is I don't think they're doing it for resale value. I think that these are the high end, these are life slaves for the personal oh, okay. use of the hitman boss. All right. They're there for him. He is purchasing them as a, as it's kind of, it's no, it's buying a car. Right. You drive it until it breaks down. Right. So, I mean, that's what he's doing. He's buying a 17-year-old virgin, and he's going to use it till it breaks. 
and then he's done. But my question, and this is one I pose to you, okay. and I'm just going to ask you on the air. We can make it short. But on the black market, these girls are going for $500,000, uh-huh. and they're going to scum. Yeah. Just because it's the black market. Yeah, sure. I mean, they may be nice guys, but they're still not going to be... If you're buying a woman on the black market, it's not because you respect them. Mm-hmm. So on the white market, assuming legality of selling yourself as a permanent sex slave, do you think that you could get more money for your... I mean, so this is selling yourself. Sure. You're on your own market, so this is all your income. All right. You mean if she just went out there uh, in a Post country, a let's say that... Lad. Okay. So you're just going out and you are saying lifetime indentured servitude. Till you uh, die. Right. Uh, I don't know. I have honestly no evidence to, you know, I know that high-end prostitutes make well over $500 million if they can, you know, do their booking right, yeah. I guess. Uh, so I don't know. <laughs> By the way, don't ask me why I know what a high You can tell from the fact we're asking for donations so often on this show that I cannot afford a high-end prostitute. But if you were to just actually sell yourself into slavery, I have no idea what you're Me would neither. Make. No I was idea. just I was wondering if the white market has a better sure, margin value sure. than black market. It's interesting to think about the um the way that the price would fluctuate from a legit market into a black market. I think you could probably see that with the legalization of different drugs yeah. and bootlegging sure, and so sure. forth. But far away from anything this film is concerned with. Right. Uh definitely a topic for another show. If we could get back to Taken, and back specifically to that scene you mentioned being the trailer, the they're going to take you scene, I think that is such a good scene. The The thing I like the most about that, the performance by Liam Neeson is great, and the Taken voice mm-hmm. that you use on the telephone uh, that I use to tell people what kind of groceries you know they need to bring. That voice is great. The whole setup of that scene is great. My favorite part is that the camera stays on Brian as you hear what's happening to her. Rather than focus on these men taking her and then that kind of diminishing the action when it happens later, you just see his reaction. You gain that emotional connection to him in that moment, which you need later to be following him around. It's a smart choice by the film because had they just shown you the action, you wouldn't feel as connected to him. And later when you got action, it would just be more of the same stuff. Well, also another thing that's interesting about that scene is that the last time you see Kim before Brian does is when she gets pulled out from under the bed. Yeah. You don't see her again until Brian finds her. Yeah. Right. The last thing you see is this horrible thing begin. And then you don't know what's going on. You're as clueless as he is. You're only along with what he's doing. Well, another great thing about that is he has this recording And in order to find the people that took her, he has to listen to this recording of her being taken over and over and over. And it's just fucking terrible to listen to. It's just her crying out for help and hearing the attack, you know, to have to relive that moment over and over, uh, just listening to it. And then when he actually gets to, you know, the scene of the crime, uh, they have these jump cut slow motion flashbacks, which I like a lot, where he's sort of even more graphically reliving what happened or trying to piece that together. It's just really hard for, you know, it's hard enough for uh, say a team of police officers to investigate a scene like that where Mm -hmm. they're emotionally detached, but for him to come in and you feel that he has that connection, but he has to, to shelve that, you know, so he can be the sleuth at that point. It's one of the really smart things that I think the script does. I mean, the script does a lot of smart things. It's got short, memorable scenes. They're always moving from place to place to place. You know, in that scene where he's identifying the Albanian guys, we were talking about the the voice recorder or whatever, but he's trying to get them to read and to say different things to give him clues. Um, The French police are after him through the movie, which I thought was a a great way to show that there are consequences to his actions. So often, I mean, you can attest to this having watched all these action films, especially recently. These guys go around just killing people and they, yeah, and no consequences Absolutely. ever. Never do the, the police go after, I mean, rarely. A film like, a film like Commando, uh-huh. where it's just Arnold Schwarzenegger is a wrecking ball sure. through South America. Sure, and that's what you want in a lot of films, but not a film like this. A film like this that has consequences, I mean, that feeds into the story much better. And then the action itself is great. All of the action in here is really good. I mean, from the Foley, you have that gun Foley I really like. Uh, I'm just going to keep attributing it to the French because I just don't see that or, or I guess hear it a lot over here. Here, the gunshots are always really bassy, really boomy. But I've noticed this in a couple French films that I've seen. They always have that high end of the register, that metal clanking sound. For some reason, that just makes them seem more brutal. Uh, the hand-to-hand stuff in this is really good. The guy getting hit by the car, you know, in that uh, yeah. chase scene in the beginning. 
The last kill uh, is great. Just all the action stuff, fantastic. Yeah, and the other thing that I really like about the action that it kind of separates it from what would be a typical action movie Brian, as a he's a trained professional, mm. and that leads to all of this action going on, but n- only one time, or maybe a few. There's a few times that he ever overexerts his mm. his violence. You know, he's always really deliberate. He never over assaults anybody. He ta- right. he does exactly what is necessary to incapacitate any given enemy, with a few exceptions. The one one being he leaves the guy to be electrocuted. Right. The other being well, he, that guy's directly responsible right. too. As he's working his way up the right. ladder, I think you see him get more aggressive. And then there's the secondary guy who he empties the clip into in the elevator. Yeah. yeah. Those are people that he overdoes. But then again, there's also scenes where he could have reserved himself a lot more in a normal film, but instead he goes ahead and shoots that police officer's wife. Yeah. Right. Just because he knows that's what needs to be done. But he draws the line there with killing. He says in that scene, it's a flesh wound. You know, he doesn't have time. He's fighting the clock constantly. He can't fuck around with these games. So he's going to shoot her in the arm so that we don't have to linger in that scene for it's part of the script again, you know, hopping from place to place. If we shoot her in the arm, he tells us what we want. We can get out of there. This is a film that doesn't like to linger on torture scenes or interrogations. You know, we get, I guess we only get one real interrogation Mm -hmm. and it being the electrocution one. Everything else is... Short, sweet, to the point, we just move on from place to place to place. It's part of what makes this such a well-done action film. All right, so the ending of this film is kind of odd because you get the resolution to what is the entire story. Mm -hmm. He kills the hitman villain. The Agent 47 villain, yeah. And then he and his daughter are reunited on the boat, and everything's great, and she's horrified, and he's feeling awful, right? and nobody's happy. No. And then he comes home, and her family's there, and it's still kind of a weird downer because they're all happy, but then her new her new dad and her mom and her kind of unite. And Brian's like, yeah, I did all this, but you guys are still... I'm not part of the family. Right. Without I, showing any kind of real character development, they couldn't have done anything yeah, else in that exactly. scene. Exactly. And so that that's kind of where the film starts to wrap up. Mm. But instead, there's one more thing that happens, <laughs> which is this very kind of tacked on scene. Yeah where Brian and Kim show up at that pop singer, the yeah, girl right. that plays Christy in DOA, yeah. uh, show up at her door, and there's this moment of, oh my god, he's being a great father again. Yeah. Which he would have done had she not gone to Paris. This isn't like as a result of this whole ordeal, because mm-hmm. he had the numbers. He was going to do this regardless. It seems a little too clear, a little too tangential, but I think it is something that came directly from the script. You know, when we see something like this, the first thing that goes off in our mind is... Studio said ending was a downer, make something to stick something happier on the very ending. But it's another one of those things where we could have lingered in the airport and tried to reach some crummy conclusion via dialogue. Instead, let's hop to another place. That's what the film likes to do. Let's hop to another place where you can see she arrives with the singer, everybody. You know, people are happy. You don't Mm -hmm. even need to see it. You can just tell, oh, coming to that singer's place, it's like showing her a pony. Finally, Brian gets to give Maggie Grace's character her pony. On an unrelated note, if you uh, find movies that the studio made them slap a happy ending on that, you should send them to us, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com, because I would love a list of those. Uh, Me and you thought it would be kind of humorous if she showed up to see the vocal coach and she was just terrible, because that would be a a downer. Yeah, that would be a downer ending again. All right, so coming from Taken, let's go somewhere that's slightly, uh, I I would say it's less action-y, but harder to watch. P2 is this, uh, it's a film that came out amidst the time when films like Rest Stop and Wrong Turn were coming out. All these okay horror survival (laughs) dramas. Ones that we hesitate to put into old school American horror because they're just not Not quite good enough. enough. (laughs) Yeah, because we feel like we've created a genre classification Mm -hmm. that we stole from Hatchet. But now we're being really snobby about yeah, what we want absolutely. to allow into the genre. Right. But we will allow P2. Is yeah, that Yeah, that's fine. I'll put all those fucking... Here's <laughs> the thing, is we've been really elitist about it. And so, what, Cabin Fever and yeah. Hatchet are the only Cabin two Fever movies in there. So, yeah, just let other just movies stick in. Them all in. Wrong there. turn two, going right in yeah. there. Well, so, P2, is a, it's directed by a director named Frank Calhoun. Mm-hmm. But another notable name that went into the production was Alexandra Aha. Yeah. Um, from the Hills have eyes, right. Directed the Hills have eyes. He's, he's done a lot of, you know, direction. Um, he's part of the new Hollywood splat pack. Yeah. 
which how is, have we never talked about this before you know i think we're trying not to is that what it is it, it, we'd be showboating yeah because yeah, we just there it just turns out and it's completely coincidental but they're all my favorite directors yeah right but there are guys we've covered on the exactly. show i mean almost all of them yeah half of their films um just accidentally completely yeah. accidentally it wasn't something we set out to do but right. i do think we should talk about that stuff here even just because it's knowledge we have, maybe people right. don't. And I think it's kind of cool. So sure. who, what is the splat pack? What is so the idea here? The splat pack is they all, it's a bunch of directors that all kind of started around the same time around mm-hmm. 2000. And they're directors that are known for not pulling punches when it comes to graphic right. violence or disturbing film. And they're also known for trailblazing and doing films and stuff that people haven't seen before. James right. Wan is a really good example of that, the guy behind Saw. Mm-hmm. And then Bowsman picked up on that. He's also kind of lumped in there. And then right. we have Alexander Ejo, who started with High Tension, and then he's gone on to do plenty of violent flicks sure. from there. Yes. And then we have... Producing as well as directing a lot of them. Right. And then we have our two of my uh, my three... Uh, Rob Zombie, Eli Roth, and Neil Marshall. Yeah, you don't even have to say their names at this point. Although Neil Marshall hasn't come up in a while. Yeah, well, um, we covered we've covered two of Neil Marshall's films. Right. Neil Marshall did The Descent and Dog Soldiers. I think we've probably already covered Doomsday just in how many times we've yeah. mentioned different pieces of it on the show. Uh, but yeah, the Neil Marshall stuff too. So all of these guys are just they're they're all horror directors. I guess right. that I should say that even though that seems to go kind of implied. Saying. Well, and the other the other piece that I feel like is really missing here is this whole thing came about at a time when the trend in horror was steering back towards PG-13. Mm-hmm. So this was kind of a movement that said, all right, we need to, to bring horror back to the R rating. We need to focus on violence above all other things, uh, almost the movement being a piece of art itself. Right. Here's the concentration. Here's what we feel is left out of all of these other pieces. We're going to provide something that almost solely focuses... I mean, think back to a lot of these films. Think yeah. back to the stuff we covered on the show. They don't do a lot more than it be incredibly violent, and they exceed at that. Yeah, uh, they do very, very well at that. And P two is no exception. I no, mean, P two no, has has a has a more of an art story that ends in a bloodbath. It's modern day exploitation. You oh, know? totally. It's uh, something we've talked about before, but I think that's why this movement came about because. All of these directors, I mean, we've talked about half of them just as just in spotlighting the directors themselves Mm -hmm. being fans of the old stuff. Eli Roth and Rob Zombie come to mind right away. For sure. But you even see some of that stuff in Bowsman's work, whether he knows he's inspired or not. You know, Eli Roth, uh, I remember seeing I don't remember what movie he was working on, but he's wearing a different colored cannibal Holocaust shirt uh, every every day on the set. You know, they're influenced by this old stuff. They feel like it's disappeared and they're creating exploitation movies, those same kind, but in today's packaging, not callbacks like Black Dynamite or like, you know, Planet Terror sure. or anything like that. They're making movies that appeal directly to today's audience without any callback factor. Right. But doing the same kind of thing. And you know what? It's studios, too. Yeah. I mean, we've seen what? The same two. I guess yeah. it's the same it's two mostly, studios. It's mostly Lionsgate, Lionsgate and, Dimension. and Dimension. Yeah. Uh, the only time you really see see them veer into different studios is, I believe, when the property is already owned by the remix. Yeah, you know sure, something sure. like uh, the Hills Have Eyes. I think was Fox Searchlight, Fox um, Atomic. Yeah, it was one of the the Fox uh, the Fox labels, and I think that's because they already owned rights yeah. to the. Although I could could be mistaken uh, on that one, but it's pretty much Lionsgate and Dimension yeah. leading the way in a lot right. of these things. So you've seen a lot of horror movies, yeah, and no matter how many of these things I watch, you always double or triple my numbers on these. So I want to ask your opinion. There are two different ways to treat your scare shots in movies. One is to let viewers know right in the beginning that it's a scary movie by scaring them with stuff that is not frightening at mm-hmm. all. And the other is to trick them into uh, what kind of movie. I can't think of a good example, but um, what was that uh, that Japanese movie people always want us to talk about? Audition? Yeah, Audition, where it seems like it's a nice, happy movie in the beginning, and then all of a sudden it gets fucking scary out of nowhere. So this movie does that thing where it's a scary movie, but it has not yet gotten to the scary stuff, but they still try and do scare shots. Yeah. You know, like the scene in the beginning, I mean, not even the flying tom-tom, which we'll talk about, or maybe we won't. That's all that needs to be said, uh-huh. right? We found another flying tom-tom. It's in this movie. Um, a uh, term we coined back with... Million Dollar Hotel. Million Dollar Hotel, RC. yeah, that's right. Um, but Angela runs into Carl upstairs. There's nothing scary about this. There's nothing ominous about it. Uh, Carl's not going to come back and stab her in the end. It's not foreshadowing. It's not foreboding at all. 
it's just the two of them accidentally colliding upstairs but the music treats it like it's mm-hmm. a scare show. so how do you feel about when the movie's trying to scare you with things that aren't scary just because it feels like it's its job to scare you I honestly, I, it's effective. It works. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I'll jump. John Carpenter's really good with that, especially in (laughs) his early stuff. Like Escape from New York, there's a lot of weird loud noises that just scare you, but there's nothing behind it. Well, you want to talk about that. You know what I think is funny is Wes Craven movies are all that. There's never anything scary in Wes Craven movies, but it's all treated as if it was scary. I feel betrayed because I feel like... Because if I were in the situation, it wouldn't scare me. Right. It's because I'm sitting watching and there's loud noises. Yeah. Boo. That's not fair. Well, maybe if you come around the corner and you accidentally bump into Carl, you're a little frightened. Either way. The thing I don't like about it is that it treats that situation on par with the things that happen later. Exactly. Well, that's what I mean. When the dog jumps through the window and tries to eat you, it's as scary as when you accidentally bump into your Your security guy or whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's not right. Mm. You know, I feel like it's... Uh, rather than builds tension, I think it diminishes the kind of maybe not tension, the but the scares of your scare you. Shots. Well, it could be, yeah, I guess the integrity. It diminishes what's about to come. It puts it on the level, uh, but not in effect. Yeah, I guess I don't know. But when you think back to something like audition, the fact that it doesn't, you know, we could complain about stuff about audition all day long. But one thing I think it accomplishes uh, very, very well, spot on is that if you don't know anything about audition, then you have no idea that the second half of the film is going to do that. Right. But if they put a bunch of bumbling scare shots in the beginning, then you would be saying to yourself, this movie's going to get scary later. And when it does, you would have expected it already. But the difference, here's what I like about P2, is that you know going in, I mean, if you you look at the fucking DVD Well, the flying tom-tom tells you where it's going. The movie, you know it's a horror movie going in. What you don't know is how violent of mm. a horror movie it is. Yeah. And that doesn't even get started until maybe 45 minutes into the film. Yeah, right. You well, see, the real violence. You yeah. you kind of know where it's going about that. But yeah, I guess there's a lot of talking even before you see, the, well, the first it starts, thud. It, it really arcs really quickly. There's a there's a quick incline of discomfort. Mm-hmm. Wes Bentley's character, Tom, yeah. uh, the security guard. Yeah. It, it starts normal, and then the first thing you see of him where things go amiss is where he... I, I mean, chemically, I'm guessing chloroform knocks her out and then right. she wakes up and he's dressed as Santa Claus. Right. And she's what? Well, so in the, a dress. The thing I think is even more fucked up about that scene and why I think this is really, really cool is uh, there's just something completely messed up about waking up in different clothing. I mean, that says something about him as a, a captor. You know, he didn't strip her down naked because that would tell you immediately what his intentions are. He's going right. to rape her and it's sure. scary and that's the story you're telling then. But the fact that he removes all of her clothes and then has a separate set of clothes that he has prepared and put on her so when she comes to, she's in different clothes, that makes you question, you know, his desires at that point aren't just sexual. Maybe doing uh, explicitly violently sexual things is probably some of the worst stuff he could do to her. But at this point, you don't know how bad it's going to get because she woke up in different clothes. Right. There's an entirely different fucked up level you're working with. And the other thing is that Tom, and we were talking about this, Wes Bentley, Wes Bentley's character of Tom, the mm-hmm. way he portrays Tom <laughs> yeah. is so difficult to get your head around yeah. because one minute he's freaking out, don't call me Tom, mm-hmm. you know, running somebody down with his car, repeatedly pounding this guy yeah, against yeah. the cement and then in the next then scene, he's an angel again. He's wondering yeah. where he's wondering where Angela went to. Yeah. You know, Angela, where are you? I, I I'm so, I just want to be friends. I'm sorry <laughs> right. if I scared you. Right. Your dinner's gonna get cold. Yeah. But he's not. It's not creepy and it's not facetious. He's 100 percent sincere in his mm. concern for. He just wants her to be okay. Yeah. He's not trying to hurt her in his mind. He has no bad intentions, and it's amazing to see how twisted his twisted his intentions get. By just, I guess, protecting himself a little bit and preserving what he thinks are her best interests. Well, that's some stuff that goes back to the classics. I mean, we want to talk about people who drew from older stuff, maybe not even so much exploitation, but from the origins of horror, that dual personality type of killer. I mean, people are going to tell you all the time that goes back to the psycho Psycho, thing. Psycho, yeah. But I think that goes back even to uh, Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah. You know, to have somebody who is sweet, charming, or, you know, just one personality that's the opposite of the other personality. 
With Jekyll and Hyde, it was kind of more reserved, shy, intellectual, but then he basically turns into the fucking right. Hulk. You know, I mean, that's the Hulk. That's the yeah. personality of the Hulk. That's the entire reason that that even works as a character. And so that stuff draws from some of the old stuff. But I think the movie also comments on a lot of different captor situations. And it's, you know, he mentions that thing um, in the car about how she's trying to humanize him by using Saying his, his name. name. Right. You know, he's seen the old movies. Right. Well, he he's knows seen the Silence of the that, Lambs. Yeah, yeah. There's another great one that, you know, people draw on all the time in trying to craft their really personable killers. Uh, and that shit's not going to work on him. You know, Stockholm Syndrome is another thing that anytime you deal with captor movies, cleverly, neither of these films even go into. Um, I've only seen Stockholm Syndrome used in a few instances yeah. where I didn't think it was cheesy or really, yeah. hey, I read a psychology textbook, you know, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, there's a little bit of it in The Human Centipede, which is weird. Oh, yeah, I haven't seen that. But the captives never develop emotional connections to their captors. Um, Angela tries to convince Tom that she thinks he's a likable guy sometimes, but there's never a point where she really says, Hey, I understand you're a human being. You just made a mistake, you know, anything like that. There's no redemption for him. Well, and then there's that other weird scene in dealing with Stockholm syndrome, similarly to the way he deals with bringing identity to her by using his name, where he Mm -hmm. says, you know, sometimes people in tense situations (laughs) end up really liking each other. And sometimes... They end up loving each other. Right. And it's it's like he's calling out Stockholm Syndrome. Yep. It's like he's going, I know this could happen. I'm kind of kind, kind of, of banking on it. it. Yeah. And she and that it that it's at that point in the film that the film gets to go, No Stockholm Syndrome is not going to happen here. It's a great way to bring back the exploitation stuff without just becoming a cliche. You know, we see some of the tactics that have been used in the you know, meat cart. We talked uh, in Hostel about Meat Cart. Yep. I think I complained on the show before that we don't, I, I thought we would see Meat Cart come up more, but it's, uh, it's a scene where there is a piece of time lost in how they're showing you events portrayed. She's locked to a gate, or her hands are caught in a gate, and he's coming around the corner, and we keep flashing between her locked in the gate and him coming around the corner. And as he turns to the corner, he looks at the gate, she should be there. But there was about five seconds the movie didn't show us where she got away, or she got away as he was walking right. there. There's two of them, actually, in this movie. We got a double header on the meat cart, which is kind of rare. But there's also the one where she gets the axe, and we think he's in the booth. We keep seeing these scenes of him in the booth. They keep going back and forth. And by the time she swings around that door and she's got the axe in her hands, he's not in the booth anymore. But then on the other side of it, we have the classic horror stuff where... uh You know, for instance, she's inside this parking lot, right? But the horror creators still manage to somehow drench Angela. She is soaking wet for what the second half of the movie. Yeah. I mean, it's not exploitative enough to have her running around in this dress where her basically her tits are just leaking out of the dress. And then they're just dousing her with water twice. Twice. She gets doubled out. Well, she starts to dry off. Yeah. It's the elevator is the, the first one. The and last then, thing you need is the end of the film to be less sexy than the middle of the film. Right. So what, the sprinklers come on? Absolutely. Yeah, it's just classic stuff. I think that's one of the components we've seen to the uh, the splatter stuff is it can't just be splat. It has to be the fun tongue-in-cheek. I wouldn't call it self-aware, but, you know, exploiting women in the way that uh, Jeremy Caston talked to us right. about, where he argued at the time it wasn't misogyny. I don't know about that. But I would still say that we're aware of what we're doing, and we do just like to see naked people on screen. There's something fun about that, and everyone's kind of going along for that ride. So the thing that we kind of need to touch on is the title. Mm -hmm. title, It's a very strange title. The film is called P2, and that is because that is the name of the level in the underground parking garage where Angela parks her BMW. Right. The entire film takes place in the Empire State parking facility underneath the Empire State Building. In New York City. Mm -hmm. And the film is just, it's amazing how many ways you can use something as simple as a parking garage. Right. How just having four levels of the same shit gives you places to hide. It gives you places to smash people against the walls. You don't need new characters. No. They bring in the cops. They could very easily bring in the cops and then integrate the cops into a a plot where they're killing, where they're being killed, stuff like that. But the cops kind of come in drive around, drive back out, and Angela is just as fucked as before. Because when you're in this parking garage, in real life, the only other person in there is the security guard. Mm -hmm. And if the security guard is out to get you, 
you've got no chance if you can't get out of the garage. Yeah, it's some of the stuff we talked about in when we did Inside. Yes. Um, just kind of being stuck in one place. And, you know, those movies come up all the time because I fucking love being stuck in one place in movies for some reason. Something that the creators noticed worked in other situations, and they built their entire film around it. You know, one other thing that we have to go out on, because I didn't get to touch on it, but while we're talking about this new splat pack generation of filmmaking, I'm going to consider it a generation because I hope that there are hundreds more Mm -hmm. that are just going to appear, hopefully after we post this episode. Um, There's that long tradition of you can't kill the kid and you can't kill the pets. And in this film, we not only kill the dog, we mangle it in a horrible, horrible manner to be applauded, I guess. I beg for killing the kid and killing the pet. Bring kids into your film to kill them. Absolutely. I'm right there with you. So we have a website, which is doublefeatureshow.com. What else do we have besides a website? Oh, we have email. You can go doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. To... I asked people to email us something. What did I ask about? Uh, something about downer endings, right? Oh, yeah. Studio. If you saw a downer ending. Downer ending redux. Or, yeah, downer ending redux, right. If you saw a happy ending that you know the studio made them tack on. And furthermore, let's make our audience be a little creative here. How you could take that exact same ending and in the simplest, quickest, most efficient way possible, make it a downer ending once again, using the, the, the same scene that they did. Uh, so email that to us, yeah. double feature show at gmail. Then we have the Facebook thing. Mm-hmm. Get on the Facebook, talk Dear to fan. us there. Uh, go on iTunes, leave a review. Yeah. And is there anything else? We're going to do a films that bastardize the books they're based on. Oh, that's great. Uh, we're going to cover, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And that's Young based on a book. It is. It's based on the Odyssey. Oh, oh yeah, I guess that's true. I didn't even think about that. That'll be the first time we talked about the Coen brothers. I'm sorry. I got excited and cut you off. What are we doing? It's okay. We're going to do, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And Young Frankenstein. Young Frankenstein. That's the other one. I think we should come back very quickly to this stuck in a place thing because I've got two just off the top of my mind that kind of do that, but uh, in different ways. And you know what? We're coming on October and I think we're just, we have too many horror movies that we try and sneak into the show. I'd say we just nail horror all October. Scary month. Uh, but before that, we're going to move as far away from that as possible. Right. Although Young Frankenstein, I mean, Frankenstein's Ter- it's, a, kinda... it's a terrifying film. Absolutely <laughs> right. horrifying. Horrifying. I am there. Watch more fucking film. Bye.